And if I may just go back to the original question, key questions that we want to explore with you is how can this better support business incubation function in a way that's sustainable and effective? We heard from um, all the speakers that uh, the aggregation of all those businesses is very important. And uh, uh, we, we just heard from Juan Carlos that the, the ADEA and the cooperative that they work with were instrumental to make the model of affiliate working, uh, working really well. So how do we also, how can they also provide support in organizing community group level income generating and analyzing the support activities to be taken to scale linked to business incubation skills and the market players. So for example, as in the previous case, can they support some of the development of viable apex level organizations for small scale producers? If so, how? And the last question, and uh, many of the speakers also spoke to that, is about the de-risking. So how can they provide more support for de-risking investment into small scale producers so that those organizations can attract the finance? And we heard the good example about SB Life where um, the contract and the, or the innovative way to monitor some of the activities really help uh, be risk for the financial providers, but also help build up the credit and score for the smallholders so that they can actually be able to access more finance. And so the, all those three questions are quite amazing, and I hope that you can also think about some of the following up questions for the speakers, but I know some of the audience here also have quite a lot of experience to share with those questions. So do feel free to use that question for the speakers box to make comments and share your experiences and thoughts on how this can tackle some of the three areas. And now if I can go back to some of the questions that's already on the screen. Uh, first, Mark, if I can just ask you to address the question, two of the questions. When is on the F3 system would also work with the conditionality based on forest restoration, not just climate smart agriculture? That question is from Duncan. And uh, the follow-up question on that is that then in that case, could the trees then be used as collateral with your lenders in the event of default? And then there's another question from Achille about how were the farming practices directed and are they based in local practices or simply approved scientific practices? And uh, to link that question probably back to the financing question we're thinking about. Mark, can you probably also elaborate a bit on how you can use the financing system that you are developing on the F3 life to incentivize some of the farmers to adopt batch practices on their land that, to, that can be inducive for a sustainable business model for forest related enterprise? Mark, I hand to you to answer that two questions. So, uh, the, I'll, I'll take those questions in, in order. So, the question from Duncan, um, yes, our system would work on the basis of forest restoration. Um, I think, I guess there's always a question around you know, what is forest restoration, but sort of skirting around that, um, just a sort of caveat. Uh, um, the limits to the F3 life system are that it's only suitable for farmers who are sufficiently sophisticated to, to take and repay commercial debt. Um, uh, and this wouldn't work with, with smallholder farmers who are sort of conventionally unbankable in the jargon. And, and, and that's actually the majority of the smallholder, smallholder farmers. Um, so the, the F3 life system is only going to work uh, you know, Within areas where where, yeah, yeah, where, where where farmers are sort of considered you know, credit worthy, um, to get around that problem, we've actually launched a, a sort of a sister business um, called GreenFi, and you can you can look at the the, the, the website.
before that, uh, greenpride.org. Um, and that allows uh, NGOs or similar to place funds within a community managed revolving fund. Um, and uh, the community to manage the loans uh, themselves. Um, and for environmental conditionality, be placed on those loans. And then our system allows for a, a community managed monitoring system as well. Um, and that is applicable to the sort of larger number of, 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 of smallholder farmers or small scale producers who are not, not conventionally bankable. Um, so we've deployed these two different systems. Um, the second, Green Fires, in, in partnership with two organizations, IUCN and PACT. Um, so that's just, just for reference. But, um, absolutely, you know, you know, climate smart agriculture is, is only one of the, the ways in which the system can be used to, sort of, to adjust to small scale producer behavior. Um, and actually, so the language of climate smart agriculture is very much sort of you know there because that's where the funding opportunities are or were at the time when, when we were getting going. Um, and then the, the question from uh, Akile. Um, well, how are the farming practices developed? Local best practices or scientific practices? Well, actually, um, a little bit of both. Um, uh, uh, we sort of take the off-the-shelf, I guess, practices, um, and then through uh, sort of participatory discussions with, with, with farmer focus groups, we adjust the requirements to suit the, you know, what they're, they're used to and capable of doing. Um, and as an example, uh, in, in Kenya, the requirement was for, for, for grass contour strips um, in, in, in the first instance, and then uh, as, as loan sizes increased uh, for the planting of, 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 sea, of, of trees to, to reinforce those, those, those grass strips. Um, and the farmers themselves were allowed to choose both the grass type and the tree seeding according to what they, they knew best and wanted to use. And uh, we just got informed that for Carlos, unfortunately, we need to leave us a bit early. And we would uh, probably, before Juan Carlos go, first ask a question about the recommendation for FIP on upscaling investment with small medium enterprises in Mexico. This question from, comes from Iselda, and, and it's because that uh, Iselda um, so knows that Akile is engaged in some of the activities in Mexico. Could you probably explore a little bit on that question, Juan uh, Yes, of course. Uh, we, uh, we don't have right now currently an investment in Mexico, uh, and mainly because we didn't have uh, a project developer we, can, we, we know for, for a long time. And it, it seemed like to be too risky for us. If there is a jurisdiction for FIP, that FIP will be interested to, to promote investment, we can, for example, agree into a co-financing initiative, FIP having a catalyzer role uh, for us in terms of, uh, let's say, first loss or co-financing under a grant-based project, which can reduce the cost and also uh, uh, de risk a little bit our position. In that case, the investment decision will, will be faster. What I think is very important, uh, you know, representing a fund, is why a private fund, a specialized private fund, can do a lot of things in short periods of time. Just an example, we deployed 100 million euro or committed it in just four years, which, you know, many, many funds, institutional funds are not able to do is because we have a specialized team, we have boots on the ground, and we can spend a lot of time on, on co-building the opportunity. So I think that FIP, as a, you know, uh, probably a, a, as a recommendation, we, we, we could have a conversation, or FIP could do it with other funds as well, as the Moringa Fund, for example, how to agree in a jurisdiction, the impact both FIP and the investor are looking at, and then create an element at the top level that then will allow the fund manager to, to deploy the investment. I think it's very important to overcome uh, sometimes, uh, you know, these, these barriers of communication. In Peru, we knocked the door of the FIP that has been managed by, by IDB at the moment. We couldn't co-invest in this project. Uh, 
uh, because I think the area of of uh, eligibility what well, didn't match, but of course we would be more than happy to collaborate with FIT, uh, and this is what what this the risking uh, or co-financing initiative could be uh, catalytic. May I just ask for a follow-up question on this? Uh, when you mentioned that it's being considered too risky and uh, it will be useful to have this help to risk, could you just expand on what are some of the specific risks that you consider? You obviously mentioned that you want to rely on trusted local partners. And what are some of the risks that Ophelia and your investors would consider when they look at some of the financing reports related enterprises? Yes, of course. First, we, we love the risk. And this is why we are, what we are designed to, to be additional, not to be like other financial institutions. Uh, this is our mission, so we are really risk, not risk adverse, but really we have a, a big appetite for risk, but we need to know how to manage that risk, uh, which is different, to avoid risk. So the way we manage the risk in terms of project implementation in Peru, to be Madre de Dios, far away, with a lot of trouble, is through the project developer. Project developer, grassroots, well-established, 30-year-old operations, very reputable. That's how we manage the risk of, let's say, performance on the project. The market risk, in terms of the cacao, what happened if the cacao didn't work well, and also, uh, what about uh, what about the fluctuations or types or things related to that? We we actually manage to that risk through a hedge, or let's say a coverage, through a USA guarantee. Uh, the loan we provide to to for the cooperative, the operations of the project was under actually was guaranteed by USAID through a 50% loss guarantee by the Development Credit uh, Authority of USAID. So that that support a lot. If FIP can do things like that, will be will be great for us uh, to catalyze, for example, investment in Mexico. Uh, we couldn't make it for for uh, for at, at, on the first fund we had, but we we, we can do it. Um, so the the question is not if there's a risky place. We go to risky places. You know the, the deforestations are in these risky places, deep on the forest, different land use uh, use different land use types. Uh, we just need to know how to manage it. Uh, the implementation risk you can manage quite well with a good project implementator and then things related to market could be implemented through uh, these uh, market, market enhancement instruments, uh, price guarantees, off-takes, um, uh, first loss as well. And I think if FIP, uh, we, we, we would be more than happy to do that with, with them. And so, having said that, uh, as as uh, Shaheen said, I, I would I really need to run, but I was I was it was I was very happy to participate in, in this uh, in this webinar. And please, you have my, 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 my contacts in the which Shaheen can share as well. And, and let's keep in touch. And thank you very much. Thank yeah. you so much, Juan Carlos. And uh, yeah, please, the audience, feel free to. You can just send a phone call question directly, or you can keep in um, putting your comments and questions in the question chat box, and we can pass it on to Juan Carlos as well. And uh, the, probably while we're on the risking topic, uh, may I probably go to Paul now? And Paul, in your presentation, you did talk about the importance. And uh, in the Uganda case, where you actually worked with those uh, smallholders in managing reduce the risk and uh, generate better returns, could you please help elaborate a bit on some of the risks that you do see working with the uh, people on the ground and how you manage to de risk them? And then we can go to some of the questions that other audience have posed for you. Thank you. Talk about risk. I listed um, 
how, ways of reducing the risks for small growers. I mean, they apply to all growers, but particularly for small growers. And uh, what happened was they fell into two categories. One is the actual growth of the trees, the silviculture, which you see, this has just come up. Now, basically what we're saying is uh, quite often uh, growers, small, medium growers in particular, have poor growth and poor quality. Uh, and, but there are ways, as we've shown through SPGS, of um, improving that. So following the best practices, uh, not just nominally, but you know, making sure the staff, the extension staff are well trained. Uh, contractors, if they're used, must also be trained in these practices. Sometimes you have to bring these in from outside, whether it's from Southern Africa or Brazil, the countries with the big plantation history. Okay. Uh, secondly, fire protection is a big issue. Um, again, for small small farmers in particular, um, you know your investment can disappear um, in an hour or so. Simple protection measures measures can be taken. Um, as you get bigger, you have to certainly plan and invest in infrastructure, train the people, and get some equipment. You can reduce these risks substantially. Uh, and pest and diseases is becoming increasingly important, in, particularly in um, exotic plantations. A lot of pests coming uh, into Africa, into the eucalypts uh, from Australia. We've got to keep abreast. There's no, you know, no need to panic, but good silviculture can reduce that risk by having, for instance, good weeding, reduce the stress in your crop. But longer term, it needs investment in, in research, particularly tree breeding. Uh, and this is, is really important. And then the second batch of, of risk uh, is, is the markets and utilization of categorizing that. And the fourth point there, you see a lot of small farmers have isolated small plantations, not realizing the implications of transporting their product to market. So it's very, really important. We realized within a year or two how important in the soil log scheme about the location of growers. And we stopped. Uh, supporting people uh, in isolated places and started this aggregation that everyone's talking about. So, uh, that also brings about the fifth one, the lack of scale. Um, when you have a few isolated growers, you have very weak negotiating powers. And in theory, the clustering uh, can, can help you, but I have a sort of uh, rider attached to the timber grower associations because uh, what I'm seeing, particularly in East Africa, is you know some good and bad things, really. Their expectations can be very high on these timber grower associations, uh, or, or they can be more like maybe the Uganda one is now developing into a more business-like approach. Um, you know, it tends to happen as if the donors fund these TGAs, the grower associations, they can sometimes, their expectations are far too high. So if you let it come from the growers themselves and, and support it, then they're much more likely to succeed. Uh, number six, low value. Uh, markets for trees. This is really to do with, um, as we said before, checking your market before you plant, doing, getting the intelligence. Or, I know a lot of things can happen between planting and harvesting in forestry, but still, you can reduce the risk by going for markets which look good. So, it's, you know, 10, 15 years' time, there will be a good market for transmission poles or for saw logs, whatever. And the seventh point is inefficient uh, processing is a big issue, particularly we see it in East Africa a lot. Uh, you get these little mills running around, uh, paying peanuts to some of the farmers. And the reason is they have very low recovery, because if you have this sort of equipment, you can't afford, and you're getting low recovery, you can't afford to pay the grower very much for his log. So this whole area of the sort of primary processing in particular uh, certainly needs technical and possibly financial support. Ms. Darius also have a question about the timber export restriction and the small depressed market market means that some of your growers can't get even the lot price. And uh, is that something that the project could have foreseen? And if so, do you think it could have been addressed in tandem with expanding the planted area? And if so, how? Right. Um, a good, good question, Darius. Uh, and if you know the answer, <laughs> please let me know. We are, we are um, dumbfounded. We, it's a mystery why the prices in Uganda for saw logs are depressed. We've tracked the prices of them over the years and put, used to publish it every three months in the newsletter. Um, <clears throat> and certainly at the moment, the last number of years, it, they haven't gone up anything like you would have expected from the demand projections. Um, 
but it's so it really is and i don't think the export restrictions is, is the answer or is the reason it is a, it's quite a strange phenomenon there we don't know how much timber really is coming in say from the congo um, but it is a strange but really I think it's the, we sort of accept in SPGS that when we started, we didn't do this market intelligence enough, but I think we realized it after a few years and started to do that. Um, and in a more general uh, comment to this question, I think it highlights the importance of doing these sort of sector studies in a country, um, looking at the main products, the supply and demand and the forecast in each country. Um, we did one last year in Tanzania. And it really does show you um, surprising things sometimes with markets which farmers think they're going to grow. For instance, the transmission pole market in Kenya, everybody's growing for this. And of course, you know, at some stage it's going to be saturated and, it's, and they're going to be a lot of disappointed farmers who won't probably replant their crops. So these things, you know, you need these sort of fundamental studies, I think, to back up whatever project, uh, whatever financial support is going to be given to the sector. Thanks. And uh, Darius, feel free to comment, um, further comment in that question box. And I think the key, well, not, if we come back, we we're focusing on some of the three key questions we posed about this. And uh, Akili has usefully raised one of the common issues that I think probably all the speakers, including Tom, you can respond or speak to, is about the barrier for small producers. One of them is obviously the cholesterol, as some of the speakers spoke to, and uh, I guess monitoring of some of the small holders activities by financial institutions. So in your view or your understanding of um, these activities and your experiences, how can this issue be resolved? So should I probably hand over to Tom probably to respond to that first? Yeah, um, I, I agree. I think there's some really interesting discussion around this. Um, certainly in, in Ghana, we had some useful discussion with small and medium um, tree growers uh, who were very keen to get engaged in uh, producing trees. Um, there was land available, but they lacked two key things. One was technical, uh, effective technical support, which Paul has talked about very clearly, and the second thing was financing. Um, the two the two things were just not available. Um, it was it was effectively people were financing it from their own savings, uh, from families uh, borrowing from within their family, um, but they were unable to go to uh, formal uh, financial institutions and, and leverage uh, financing uh, because banks just weren't ready to look at uh, small scale timber production. It was too risky. It was too long term. Questions of land tenure, um, uncertainties, uh, fire risk as well. Um, it, it, it just was impossible for people to get started. Now, I am aware that in, in Ghana, the uh, FIP program has is very aware of this, and the uh, in discussions with the national ministry, they are exploring opportunities through additional financing to see how um, some support could be provided. Um, but I, I'm not entirely sure how far that discussion has come. Uh, so I think that's that, that's really key. If I may, I might also just add, I think there's some really interesting discussion as well um, about you know, the degree to which um, you know, there's two very contrasting models here. One where you really adopt the value chain approach, the kind of model that we saw uh, certainly in Uganda, um, actually in all the speakers, where there's a very well-defined subsector or value chain that's being supported, uh, which is well known, um, the barriers, the incentives around that are well-researched and, and, and support is provided around that. And then there's this more sort of open-ended um, community bottom-up type income generating activities and support and financing to that that we've seen in uh, a number of the big projects. And obviously both have strengths and weaknesses, but, but I think you know um, perhaps one of the challenges with the with the highly participatory bottom-up community identified initiatives is that you effectively have a huge number of value chains uh, which start to emerge. It could be small scale livestock, it could be agriculture, it could be tree planting, um, a whole range of things. So any any particular project's ability to provide the needed technical support around that sort of wealth of emerging uh, income generating uh, areas is extremely difficult. 
Um, so I think there's a really important trade-off there about the degree to which projects support specific um, value chains and sectors and, and, and effectively say, look, this is what we're going to do, this is where we have expertise, and this is where we can support you. And those that, that adopt this more sort of bottom-up, um, community-driven approaches, which, which, which have a huge number of strengths and also provide um, a huge you know, opportunities for building goodwill and so on, but, but maybe less focused in terms of business incubation and, and market support. Great, thanks, Tom. So, um, for the rest of the speakers, now could you, if you can address two questions now. One is about still about how can FIP help with that collateral challenge that the smallholders face, and then at the same time, the very interesting question Tom has also posed about how do you manage that balance and the trade-off between the well-defined sub-sectors value chain approach and a bottom-up engagement approach with the community. And again, uh, all the audience, please feel free to comment and share your experiences in the chat box as well. well Paul, Paul, maybe can you start and then we can um, text mark the question. Okay, Mike, well, looking at, um, or listening to Tom's uh, questions there a little bit, I think for me, the, the thing is, you, you've heard about the background to the saw log scheme in Uganda, of course, it's not the model that you talk about and the model for the other projects. It's very, they're very, sometimes they're very country specific. And I think from what I'm seeing, there's some basic information you need um, on, you know, land, um, the situation in for the forest sector, the agricultural sector, um, and you apply these to a particular country. And I think this is what we're finding, that you can take you know, lessons learned. I think this is really important. The lessons are starting to come out now across the board of things that work. And yet still many projects um, start and fail for the same reasons they have for many years. <laughs> so I sound very cynical. Um, Tom, maybe if, you, if you're still online, is there, can you sort of address or let me know what you'd like um, my input on beyond that? I think I think one of the one of the really interesting things that, that you you touched on, um, Paul, is this this whole question of the um, the, the, the tree growers association, the apex organisation. This is something that's really come out in actually quite a number of the um, the discussions and the presentations that have that have come that, through that. Um, and I I noticed Duncan has 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 put a question into the mix here about um, support to to tree growers associations um, in terms of providing. Ongoing market intelligence and business advice, and as well as this sort of broader question of incubation services to growers. So I suppose, you know, it's a question about. You know, you touched on it in your presentation, I think, a little bit about the the degree to which we can we shouldn't put too much into these organisations. We should let them develop their own um, support and, and define their own objectives. But I suppose, you know, it'd be interesting to know what do you think will be the long-term objective of the. Uh, Tree Growers Association, what sorts of services do you think, uh, well, do they currently provide and what do yes, they provide no, in the one that I frequently turn to, to uh, as a vision is the South African one, Forestry South Africa, uh, which is a growers organization that represents growers from the huge companies, Mondi and Sapi, right down to small growers. Now, you look at what they do, they're involved in uh, forest policy, very strong lobbying, um, government on land issues, whatever, support to the sector. They um, organize training, um, have committees that decide training and even research, fund research. Of course, they give uh, advice to growers. Now, to, to get to that level, of course, takes many years. It's a very mature uh, commercial forest sector in South Africa, so rather different, I think, to what we're seeing um, in certainly in East Africa and West Africa. But it's a vision, and I think it's always important to have a vision. If you look at um, our, my Uganda example, it was always the, we were always asked, of course, by the donors, what's the, what's the plan for the future, the exit strategy for SPGS? And of course, the sustainability of it was to build capacity in the Uganda Timber Growers Association. I think, sort of looking back, that's really not happening quick enough. And again, it comes back, there's a reluctance, I think, to let go. Uh, and, uh, you know, SPGS seen as a successful project and um, seems to be a reluctance to let go to build up the capacity of this private organization. 
Um, I think it's, it really should happen if they want it to, you know, s stand on its feet. So, and then what I see, you know, elsewhere where you force TGAs, timber grower associations, it, it, we really do just raise expectations too much sometimes, I think. Um, you know, it's not easy making a profit on low quality timber and, and it needs to be said, I think, to growers. But, you know, we've got to do what we can to uh, make it profitable for growers if they've got the right quality and, and the system and building up some of these value chains. Yes, thanks. And uh, now we can probably move on to Mark and Duncan. I think uh, in the response to Tom's question, Paul also partially addressed uh, some part of your question in terms of how um, they can fund some of the tree growers association. Uh, if you have any follow-up or specific questions, please do put it into the chat box. And now we move on to uh, Mark to address some of the two questions as well. Um, so the your first question, Zateng, is uh, um, how can FIP contribute to resolve the issue of absence of collateral amongst small-scale producers? Um, but I think it kind of needs to sort of look over the fence at what's happening in the, uh, uh, I guess, the sort of the smallholder credit financing world, um, where there seems to have been a lot of innovation over the last sort of four or five years. Um, uh, particularly in the direction of some unsecured credit uh, through value chain financing, through USSD lending, through the creation of credit reference bureaus, through the improvements made in, uh, in, in the credit scoring of, of, of low-income uh, borrowers. Um, so I think you know, what the FIP will have to do is, is start to sort of collaborate sort of more closely with, with that world. It's almost as though they're, they're, they're operating in two different silos, but actually they're often talking about sort of the same things and the same problems. Um, second question uh, is how to manage the trade-offs between uh, a value chain approach of financing and a community-based bottom-up approaches. Um, and I, sort of, I actually sort of wonder whether the two are mutually exclusive. Um, the, 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 the sometimes sort of concerning reality is that small-scale producers live their lives in, in debt. Um, and actually, they sort of, you know, from what we see from our research, have, have sort of many obligations to many, many different sort of lenders, both formal and informal. You know, they owe the bank something, they own you know, their family something, they owe the local loan shark something. It's, you know, um, and they're only ever sort of underwater to sort of more or less an extent over time. Um, and and, and so, so within that reality, I think you, know, you, you can actually have two approaches to financing. One is through the sort of the value chain and, and through the, sort of the, I guess, the commercialization of certain of their growing activities. And then others, you know, that doesn't sort of preclude and more community-oriented financing schemes, such as that sort of provided by GreenFi and you know, IUCN and Acris and Rwanda are doing something similar as well. Um, so I think uh, that that would be the answer to that. I think we are running uh, um, out of time now. So I'll, the last round, I'll just let everyone have a final remark. And especially if you feel like you have any specific last words that goes towards to that three key questions that presented on the slide. And again, the audience, please feel free also to put some of your feedback on, on thinking on the key questions in the chat box. Yeah, yeah. just yeah. Uh, yeah. to Without thank uh, one of the presenters for sharing this uh, uh, interesting uh, experiences. Um, and it, uh, for me, was uh, instructing um, to learn of uh, uh, the different initiatives and efforts that are being made to uh, support the smallholders. Uh, but just a general comment, I know we don't have much time to, to have a discussion. This initiative is about breaking or looking at how to overcome barriers uh, to financing SMEs. Uh, and the, in uh, our framework uh, of uh, analysis includes uh, looking at what are the 
investment in enabling, um, creating enabling conditions like capacity building, etc., that you have talked about, both in terms of the technical capacity, uh, securing tenure, and also um, uh, enabling them to uh, access finance for asset investment. And it does um, strike me, and I would like to have a further discussion as we go along with this uh, study on how do we use this notion of uh, supporting sophisticated uh, producers uh, because they are credit worthy uh, to bring um, a, other smallholders um, and, and by using these sophisticated producers perhaps as uh, the lead producers that can, can bring the, the relatively smaller ones who uh, can be managing revolving funds or other means uh, of producing uh, that could um, uh, increase not only the scale of getting the finance but perhaps uh, uh, addressing um, the uh, objectives that the FIP is pursuing. I know that those initiatives were started with a different uh, context and objectives, but we want to harvest the lessons to see how uh, synergies and, and leveraging of financing can be brought in by um, collaboration between these different initiatives with the, with the, with the FIP. Uh, I think also it's worth reflecting going uh, forward uh, um, on the issue of aggregation and clustering. And, and what I'm hearing is uh, working with Apex organization. It's, um, it's good, uh, but also not so good uh, uh, because of uh, um, the, the unreasonable demand. But I think uh, perhaps here there has to be an investment on the negotiation uh, because the smallholders with one actor uh, one actor each, um, they often, uh, because they lack uh, the knowledge on, on, on markets and even on the agricultural aspects in the case of, of plantations, but also lack of knowledge on, on processing other products that they can harvest from natural forest, they really need um, to work uh, in, in some sort of group, grouping and to, to have uh, institutions that can strengthen their voice. So how do we address um, the challenges of, uh, uh, that can come for organization and, and perhaps strong views on, on certain aspects to um, making sure that the negotiation uh, is in place that can allow uh, a win-win situation in terms of channeling financing, but also getting the results in terms of uh, putting good products uh, of quality to market uh, at a price that uh, is acceptable to all um, institutions that they are, are, are engaged. Um, and I think uh, maybe I'll just stop here just because of time, but I, I think we, we should pursue uh, a further discussion and also understanding how uh, the, the low risk averse institutions like Alteri are operating and working with cooperatives and how uh, this can be, um, the lessons from these initiatives can inform uh, the potential partnerships between uh, uh, finan uh, 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 financing uh, to private sector by FIP with those ongoing initiatives. Um, so I thought I should just make that uh, general comment, not expecting an answer now, but something that we should uh, pursue uh, with you and others to as this uh, work goes along. Yeah, thank you. So the highlighting of those themes in negotiation, the importance of negotiation capacities and uh, all the other key issues that are reminding us that this webinar is not really the end of the discussion and learning. Um, we are only starting to explore a number of questions with you. So if the speakers, yeah, if you also, if you don't really want to directly respond to that three questions, if you have some further thoughts on some of the key issues that you think that the learning and evaluation initiative should investigate further, focusing on some of the obviously thick and thick role in financing, skill up financing for forest related enterprises, please also feel free to share and keep your intervention short. And then I will go to Tom and Paul and Mark. Yeah, thanks, uh, Shouting. I, I really don't want to use up more time other than to say I think this has been an excellent uh, set of presentations. And for me, um, it's really highlighted the need to, to balance these two extremely complex areas of investment. One, this financial uh, tailoring the financial
packages to meet the, the specific requirements of the end users in, in ways that, that is usable and, and, and friendly um, and appropriate. But secondly, this, this enabling set of enabling investments, that's very clearly as well. And I mean, it, whether it's extension support in the case of uh, uh, the, the work in Uganda or, or market assistance as well, um, you know, linking people to markets and providing all these enabling investments, of course, also including broader regulatory and policy aspects, getting that mix uh, in a way that, that provides, uh, opens up opportunities for, for, for private sector activity is clearly a complex task and getting that mix right for me is, uh, is a really critical aspect. So I'll leave it there and, and, and see if others have any uh, final wrap up uh, comments. Paul, can we move to Neil for some of the final thoughts? Thank you. No, I think it's been um, valuable, some interesting lessons coming in, and particularly, you know, this interface between agriculture and forestry now as well, which is going to be more important, and um, particularly, as we all know, the small growers, small tree growers are going to be the future supply, uh, particularly in Africa, given the land situation. Um, so I think we really need to uh, maybe do a little bit more of this lessons learned from these um, and share them. It's quite the, one of the issues, of course, is that people don't like to publish um, bad results, let's say, <laughs> you know, but it, there are times where it's, it's really good to lessons learned positive and bad and negative so that we can uh, drive these initiatives forward. And I think particularly that we need to think more carefully on these timber grower associations because I see, you know, approaches that are not working. Um, in East Africa and some that are working and a lot of a lot of different people competing for this as well which is crazy so I think um, you know the more that we can sort of address this issue the better it will be for the small farmers just to say uh, uh, yeah th thank you very much um, uh, and maybe to just conclude by saying I, I saw there was a, uh, um, a big sort of conservation finance and conference in New York I think hosted by Credit Suisse um, a couple of weeks ago. One of the conclusions of that was the importance of replicability and scalability. Um, now, on scalability, that's fine. On replicability, you know, there's, there's a big question about you know, how replicable uh, investments at local level in different sort of agroecological and cultural contexts are. And so, so searching for these replicable business models is going to be sort of vital. Um, and, and, and that's what sort of FIP has to has to look for um, and the tools that can de-risk um, those sort of, I think, few but, but possible replicable um, investment models. Thank you all for being here and thanks to all the speakers. They spent quite a lot of time preparing the presentation to ensure that we can maximize our learning on this. And uh, again, this is not really the end of this learning journey. We will send you the presentation, not including our, including our seniors, and the, the audio recording of this uh, by the end of this week or early next week. And then that will include the contact information for all the speakers for, for you to follow up. And if you have any further comments or thoughts about this webinar, please also feel, uh, um, feel free to contact us as well. And with that, I'll just close the webinar. And thanks.